I totally just spit on the camera lens. But we're good. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And holy crap, where have we been? You said welcome back. We, uh, how long has it been? I've had two beards. <laughs> You've had two beards. I've had two beards. Yeah, yeah. Was like June can, 1st? Yeah, I think it was the beginning of last month. Yeah. We kind of fell off the edge there. Yeah. Uh, we've been kind of busy. Been doing all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, so we'll get to that in a second. But uh, if you haven't uh, listened to us in a while, or if this is your first time listening, we are on all the podcast streams. Go make sure that you subscribe there. We are also on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and all the social medias. Uh, and we've been posting tons of content lately that has been getting lots of eyeballs and content uh, conversation going. So make sure to check that out. Um, but we have a ton of content coming after this as well. So uh, we're going to try to shoot through a number of podcasts for you guys uh, over the next week or so so that you guys continue to get content from us uh, and that you don't have any downtime like you've experienced the last month. So we apologize to all those that uh, have missed Ian's sultry voice. And uh, it's understandable. To, yeah. <laughs> so we hope to get some more content out to you on a more regular basis. Uh, but where, where, what have we been doing? I mean, we've just been in the garage drinking beers or what? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've been a lot. In, we've been in the garage a lot, actually. We've been in the garage a ton. Like, yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. I was talking to people the other day. I probably wrenched more on that X3 over the last month than I did my Yamaha all in. <laughs> really? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you had a lot of uh, great uh, sponsors on that YXZ, um, but there's a lot of people that help, helped build that car into what it was. And, yeah. And uh, this car is a little bit different story. We're, we're kind of doing a lot of things on our own. and You know, lo and behold, it goes faster, which makes it easier to break things. Yep. I'm, I, I've learned that the hard way. We'll Just get so everybody that. knows, Ian has experienced his first ever belt change in his entire life this uh, last uh, two weeks ago. Oh, just the belt. Oh, wait, no, that was about a month ago. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. First belt change ever. How'd that go? It was actually a piece of cake, yeah. Except for getting that uh, that boot up on the top, I, I did uh, use some words that my mom wouldn't have been happy with. <laughs> I me think about, about half but... the time you spent on that belt change was was with that vent tube. Yeah, yeah. It it officially is on my list. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, if you're not familiar with the next three belt change, it does have a un kind of a unique tool that it uses, unlike some of the other ones where they just have a screw. Yeah. It has kind of like a cup that screws in. How'd that go? It was it was okay. You know, I, I heard people complain about it, but knowing what to expect and throwing it on there, it was a pretty quick process, at least getting it off. And that that came off really easily. I mean, the, the stock uh, toolkit that the X3 comes with, they claim you can take apart the whole car with it. I would dispute that, but nonetheless, it it did it was it was very handy. Yeah, I would say that the uh, purpose built toolkit that they provide is uh, very limited in its scope, um, and not necessarily in that it's not capable, but in just its usability. Yeah, it's a slow process if you yeah. don't have a uh, like a ratchet or something like a ratchet would speed that up and a drill. Yeah, I think a <laughs> impact or a drill would have made would've that, that process a whole lot easier for sure. But yeah, no complaints. It uh, you know, I mean, doing burnouts, that sort of stuff happens. Yeah. So I have a reputation to uphold. So, <laughs> so we, we, we were doing a lot of prep. Uh, we went, ended up going to the uh, Conconally, uh Washington Jamboree, uh, which is just uh, northwest of OMAC and uh, has uh, turned out to have quite the turnout. So Yeah. What was your take on that? I had a blast. I, I, I was so cool, given what's going on right now in America, mm -hmm. getting the community together. I couldn't have been happier. That was a really, really fun trip. Yeah, so we posted a, a vlog of that trip and a second vlog of the writing footage of that trip. Which is up right now. Which is up right now, and you can go check that out at uh, Side by Side Guys on YouTube. Um, but uh, it, if you watch it, you'll you'll see that the the community really gets into it, and you know people are dressing up and having a great time, lots of family-involved stuff. Um, Conconoli is a very small town. Yeah, it's kind of the snowmobile hub of Washington, one of them. Of you North know, Central I mean, Washington. People are going to argue with me on that, and it, and it is what it is. But, you know, from a facility standpoint, it's not the most dialed in town. They've got a small little store where you can get gas, but really the closest center where you can go get uh, camping items and things like that is OMAC. So they do get a lot of traffic for snowmobiling. And yeah, it's it, it's dinky. You If you blink an eye, you're going to miss it. A lot of cabins, a lot of uh, not uncommon to see uh, uh, wood stoves burning, you know, yeah. the same that we would see in like a mountain town. And there's a, there's a, uh, 
two that I know of. I just haven't explored it enough. A couple of lakes that are right there on site as well. So there's some beautiful lakes yeah, right it's, there. It's a popular place. Yeah, there's a main lake that Conconelli kind of butt, buds up to. And yeah. there's tons of camping spots and RV spots and, like you said, cabins for rent. Uh, when we were up in the trails, we saw some amazing cabins up in the woods that would just be, you know, amazing to yeah. go to rent out. Yeah. Um, I'm sure those are, are booked in a year in advance. But. Yeah. You know, and when you're riding around that area, I felt kind of like I was protecting the car a little bit because we've got some plans and stuff. That's not the type of area. Like I, I think this time next year, I'm going to feel like just absolutely let it rip yeah, out there. You know, the car is going to be a, a little bit different animal this time next year, but it, it's my favorite place to ride in Washington. It really is. It's, it's, it's turned, turned into, into that. that. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's, so we went up there for the Jamboree. Uh, and when we showed up, it, we showed up on a Thursday. No. Yeah. Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. We showed up on yeah. a Thursday. So it was kind of before the Jamboree started. Uh, there wasn't really much going on other than the fact that you saw hundreds of side by sides right. everywhere. Right. Um, and all the camp spots and all the cabins were all completely booked out. Right. Um, and then Friday, uh, everybody met downtown at the city hall. They got the kind of the once over from the director saying, don't do this, go there, follow You're this being person. being watched. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're, they're just looking out for their, for their land and for their, their, uh, properties and the people that live out there and, and the safety of everybody enjoying the event. So, um, it was pretty cool. Uh, on the video, you can see there was hundreds of people just surrounding that, that announcement tower. So, um, you got to go, you got a shirt, you got, yeah. um, you know, to go on, on guided rides, poker runs. There yeah. wasn't really anything in town, though. No, there wasn't. I, I registered pretty early for it, just kind of debating whether or not we would be able to go. And uh, if it wasn't for an invite from Rich Maxey from uh, Octane Toy Box, big shout out to those guys. Uh, you know, they, they brought us out, put us up on this farmhouse that he found for an Airbnb that was outstanding. I couldn't, I mean, probably one of the best How cool night. was that farmhouse? Dude, it was probably one of the best night's sleep I've had in weeks, months. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was incredible incredibly generous of him and uh but yeah it you know there wasn't a heck of a lot going on downtown with the exception of the little meeting and uh the facilities hopefully the facilities that are available there in town like the two restaurants slash bars the gas station hopefully right. they feel that economic impact that yeah. uh, that this community brings I think that the more exposure they'll get, uh, the more people they're going to start seeing roll through. And uh, there's some there's some things like, you know, the gas station only being open between yeah. certain hours and, you know, no cell service. And so there's no really great way to communicate to the outside world while you're there. Um, which could be a positive, depending yeah, on where you're coming from. And, and for what it's worth, I don't mean this to be negative, but there have been some promoters that we're pretty close with that have tried to arrange an event in there. And they've gotten a lot of pushback from city council. Count, no, city council. Um, I don't know if that's a thing where they're scared of the community, scared of the potential damage, maybe scared. I mean, the, the most valid for me would be fire, uh, forest fires. Um, right. Yeah, you definitely wouldn't want to organize an event there this time of year. You would want to do it in May. Yeah, definitely and, more early. Yeah. Um, but that was a little bit shocking to hear that uh, there's a lot of pushback in that regard because I I mean, I, nobody's going to convince me otherwise. This industry, the UTV industry and the way that it's ascending can really carry some of these small towns that are adjacent and connected to these trail systems. For sure. I have no question about it. The weird thing is that most people that live in those small towns have a kind of a stay away from me attitude just because that's why they live in small towns. Right. And so when there's a big jarring event that brings thousands of people in, um, they can get a little off put from that. And uh, I think it's up to us as a community to make sure we're representing our community in the best way possible, leaving things better than we left them, not going off trail, not going through people's personal property, you know, just because it was a shortcut to something we wanted to do. Right. Uh, not leaving trash behind, you know, putting the fires out before we leave, you know. And there's an, you know, you touched on it. There's an element of it where you can do all those things and still meet resistance based on the fact that those guys live in a town like Conconelli for a reason because it's isolated and right. there's nobody around there. But it would be very nice if, if, if those people would consider the local businesses that support those towns and how reliant they are on the economic impact of these little gatherings. Yeah. And, and in that example of, of Conconelli and, and OMAC, if Conconelli didn't want to participate in this kind of catering to a growing community and benefiting from that, they're just sending those monies over to OMAC. Yeah. Right. right. And in an OMAC, they're going to shrug a shoulder because it doesn't really make a dent in their in their economy. Right. Whereas in, in, in Conconelli could really 
further and, lo- and create longevity in their businesses. Right, right. I just don't want to see a situation specifically in Conconally where the city councils are, councils are consul. My gosh, what am I, what am I, what am I, English? Conconally, council, yeah, consul. Yeah. I just don't want to see a situation where they are um, making it more difficult specifically for UTVs. Um, I hate to be the one to bring it up, but we're starting to see that in Moab. You right. know, Moab is trying to vote it to where you can't drive your car, you can't drive your UTV on the street. They're going to make you trailer it everywhere. There's obviously some motivation behind that. You know, I, I in some people will say, well, it's the, it's the Jeep community. No, they hate the Jeep community too, to a degree. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's some of the rumors I've, I've I've heard. You know, mind you, this is all secondhand information, but well, it goes I, like with anything, like the Dunes, with right. you know things like that, where. Uh, people that get overzealous in their positions just want to take back any kind of that um, stretch that we have yeah. in our freedoms of, out in the outdoors. Believe it or not, Reedsport, Oregon, which is for those of you guys on the East Coast, Reedsport, Oregon is adjacent to Winchester Bay, which is one of the top riding destinations on the West Coast. Reedsport is super supportive of our community. What it is where you run into the most problems with, it's the county. The county is the one that makes things a little bit difficult. Right. So, and there's some overzealous uh, community members that like to there. make their voices heard. So, no question about it. And uh, it, it would be nice to, in, in, in all the communities like this that tend to benefit from growth in this industry, um, you know, a, as a representative to, to you from our community, you know, we're looking to have dialogue and we're looking to make things better. There's no reason why we can't say, you know, slow down some expansion in certain areas to make sure that we're protecting wildlife or whatever, uh, or damage to some scenery or something like that. But there's definitely an opportunity for us all to share those resources in a, in a, in a safe and economical way that benefits everybody. Right, right. And I hate to say it. I mean, we're just going to talk about it because we like to be candid with this show 100%. Sure. I think it's something that you and I need to get involved in. Yeah, I think with there's that, definitely some efforts we could put our voice behind. I mean, when we were at that event, I, I, I could smell the wood burning. Yep. You know, for sure. I mean, you're looking at this, you're looking at the potential is what you're looking at. You're yep. looking at uh, the area and the areas that you can go and the areas that you can explore. And it's just an untapped gem is what it is. And it's, it's beautiful. It can be done in a very respectful fashion. There's events that are trail, trail centric, you know, nobody out there. There's a few people out there that are looking to just get all over the gas and ride aggressively. And there's a place for that. As long as they can do it safe. That's one thing that I think that event got really right is they trend, they, they trended towards pushing people in one direction, right? So that they wouldn't be running in head on and, you know, which isn't, which isn't easy to do given how many trails are out there, but they did it really well. They did, yeah. I, I thought I thought they pulled it off really well, but that area, that area, in my opinion, could be totally different ten years from now, and it could be just based on what this in, this industry provides. Yeah, if I were to maybe make some suggestions to the the jamboree organizers, uh, maybe bring in some vendors or maybe some brands that can have booth events, things like that, in the city hall area, to bring more you know centralized uh, people working around you know fun events. Uh, you know, with the COVID thing and everything else, I'm sure that was the last thing on their mind to, to bring yeah, people to a for sure. <laughs> concentrated area. It was area. a challenge. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that, that event stands to benefit from growing over the next few years and uh, expanding, you know, their reach like that. So, right, right. so uh, we got to go up and, and we didn't really stay a whole lot. Uh, we just were there Thursday, Friday. Uh, we went out Thursday for a ride just on our own without, you know, going through the poker runs or the guided tra- trails or anything like that. Um, found some cool little areas. Uh, you can see them in the in the vlog post. Uh, I think I covered that pretty well in the ride coverage. Yeah, I think our goal was to go somewhere where we knew nobody else went. Yep, and we succeeded. Yeah, found a cave that was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. I think I would like to go back and kind of go deep into that and see where it leads. I'll stay outside and film you coming out. <laughs> as then. long as you don't yeah. start talking about earthquakes and throwing rocks at me. I didn't throw any rocks. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> no Bigfoot stuff. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that was cool. And there's, you know, from what I've been told, there's hundreds of those things up there to go explore as long as you don't, you know, destroy the property and, and or the, the resources that, that right. are up there. Um, and then we went and found a mountain peak that obviously based off the trail, you know, the ruts in the trail were pretty f- infrequently traveled. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we were on a road. We, no we, question about it. We may have ran over some flowers. I apologize to all the tree huggers out there, but we did run over some flowers to this tree. To this technically, peak. technically not over. We we uh, do have a through. little more clearance <laughs> than, uh, yeah. 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 
so it was pretty cool. Yeah. It was some good views, and uh, I had a little bit of a stress a stress out on on the first get it go because that was my first uh, ride with you in the X3, and not not necessarily with you in the X3, but just in general as a trail ride. And you were a bit you were a bit eager to get into that throttle. I mean, I don't know that we ever hit full throttle. Yeah, it was there were some blind corners that got me puckering a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah. I I see like if it's close to me, I don't see much of anything. But if it's like my most recent eye test at distance, I'm at like a 2015. <laughs> and as soon as I see that clearing and see that there's no dust kicked up from an oncoming vehicle, no vehicle, no nothing, no moving component, I'm I'm gonna get that thing drifting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna see it first because right. yeah, from the driver's seat. Yeah. Yeah. Want, so yeah. so there was there was some anxiety there that I had to get over and. <laughs> Uh, and I, well, he hit it well. <laughs> I didn't know until we got up on the hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, there's there's part of that whole going from seat one to seat two uh, nobody that I, likes that, that nobody likes. Nobody yeah, likes for sure. That. I don't. I don't think I've ever met a person that said, "Oh, I'll I'll just hang out here and let you do that." Then. Yeah. Let me let me travel 200 miles to ride with you. No, <laughs> not <laughs> well, into it. I did, and yeah. you know, well, that, it turned out to be that. So that's right. Um, but yeah, that was a good ride. Uh, and then we headed back to camp, and um, that's when you blew your belt on the street going from dirt to pavement yeah i think i took a chunk out of it well, i was going from dirt to pavement as soon as i hit pavement you know i'm already in an angle when i floorboard it the car's going to go into a 45 degree angle and yep. uh, burn the tires out and it probably took a chunk out of the belt then right but about two miles later i hammered it to break it loose and it officially took it out <laughs> it broke it loose yeah. it's just not the right thing right <laughs> but my favorite thing and forgive me for being uneducated um a I came from a motorcycle background, and B, my first car was a YXE. When we get there and I start changing the belt out, I'm naturally looking for a chunk of belt that got taken out. And of course, these two dudes, who both come from Polaris's, <laughs> are Rich and Zach. I'm like, hey, uh, so where, where does that go? And Rich basically gives me this look and goes, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just kind of accepted. So I, 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 that was a, that was a funny moment. Yeah. The, yeah. uh, <laughs> there, it goes to the, the belt fairies. That's right. Um, yeah. and but, it was a decent chunk. It was probably about an uh, eight inch, nine inch chunk that got, yeah, taken you had out. about a, a good yeah. 10 section, 10 inch section that, that separated, delaminated. Yeah. The thing that I was very thankful for is it didn't grenade. It didn't grenade and wrap yeah. around your clutch or for anything sure. like that. We, yeah, been, it came we, off easy. You would have, uh, you would have, would have been, We'd have been for a stopped. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so uh, cool, uh, cool place to hang out and, and relax. That um, farmhouse is on uh, side by side guys dot link slash farmhouse. Uh, if you want to check out that rental, you can you know book that out. They're they're a great family. They're a working uh, farm family, right? They they do hay and cows. Yeah, um, because you know it's such a small world. I started talking to them, and they had a last name that I remembered. And lo and behold, I used to play high school basketball against the the owner. Yeah. So we got to chatting about that. Uh, he's an old, basically one of our rivals from my old high school. He played at and was a quarterback. And uh, I don't know if he's a point guard or like a forward. He's about my height, so he's probably like forward. But that, yeah, it just cracked me up and just like, what a small world. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. So, so uh, they're a great family. Uh, their kids are awesome, hardworking kids. It was pretty cool to, dude, to meet them. Dude, they were pumped when, when the full throttle trailer pulled pulled in too. <laughs> yeah. They were pretty stoked to see the was, machines. Yeah, for sure. They're used sure. to Rangers. That's right. Yeah. But uh yeah, so you can check that out. They also do weddings and stuff like that. So uh send them a, send them your uh information if you're interested. Uh we don't get anything yeah. for that. We don't spot give No, they're just great name. people, but I got to tell you though one of the best things about the Conconoli area is no cell service. That is in my line of work that sometimes <laughs> is pretty nice. You don't get much accomplished yeah. when your phone's buzzing every no, 5 not seconds. At all, but they uh the farmhouse has got had a great internet connection, so Yeah, they had we a pretty good catch, catch back up. Yeah, it was nice to come back to camp and then be able to to hit all your points and and make your contacts right. again. Uh, and then for all of our fans, uh, you know, post content. So, right. Um, and then we went out Friday. Uh, how did we start the Friday? We went to the meeting. Um, you got your package, you signed in and all that. And then we, uh, saw some friends. Yeah. saw some friends and I think we made just a quick pit stop back at the farmhouse and then kind of went out and did our own thing. Yeah, I think the group that we were with kind of had some some timing things that they had to take care of and family stuff because they had the family there. And, right. Uh, so we went out and, uh, again, 
went down a trail that we thought people probably didn't go down. Well, and the reason we did it is because there was a guy in our way that wouldn't get out of our way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't like he was Whoever going that slow, is. but he so was, a yeah, few people he, have already he was going identified, slow enough. <laughs> a few people have already identified who they were in that video. Really? <laughs> so, so whoever that was that we were behind, I just want to uh, apologize for being on your tail the whole time, but we were, you were going a little slow. <laughs> We had places to be, bud. Yeah. I bought so, a turbo. I, I, you know, I, I intend on using it. <laughs> yeah. So we found a trail, made it up a, to a peak Not on a the- a great trail. That was a pretty cool trail. There was a lot of burnout on that yeah. trail. Um, and then we got stopped by, by the forest. Yeah. A lot of fallen trees. We don't have a chainsaw, so that kind of took us out. But Yeah. It was just an unmaintained trail at that point. So the, the, there were some big fires that went through there a few years ago and wiped out a bunch of forest. And, and I think that uh, trail was just part of that system that just got left to right. to grow back. So, Yeah, once we got turned around, we found some locals. Yeah, that was almost immediately we yeah. turned around and found them. So. Yeah. No, that was <laughs> outstanding. We uh, they The trail that we were on, it had a Y, and it was very clear that the Y down to the right was a straight downhill quad trail. And, you know, when you're alone, you have, you have no idea what's down there or anything. It's one of those things where you just kind of, you're, you're a little overcautious, probably protecting the rig a little bit, but the locals get in there like, oh yeah, we're going down that. I'm like, yeah. well, we're coming with them. And, <laughs> and part of that was also you're, you've been beelining it up this mountain yeah, and you're expecting to get to the top of the mountain. You don't right. want to go back down a trail. Right. So right. without knowing what that trail, where that trail goes. Right. Yeah. That was a, that was a great trail. It's actually up. Uh, we did, you did a, uh, you did an Instagram story on it. You did an Instagram post on it, some mm-hmm. Facebook stuff. That trail, the camera, you just got to bear in mind, the camera does that stuff no justice. For sure, you know, the it's angle. A, it's a, it's a, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a four, we were all in four low. I wouldn't say four low has to be done no. on that trail, but it is a, it's a crawler, you know. If you're going up, you're going to be in four low, but. Yeah, for sure. Uh, if you're going down, you could be on breaking. A, and you're, if you're going down, you could darn near be in neutral. You're just yeah. going to be bouncing off some trees if it's muddy. and it gets that, a little narrow. Yeah, that was a lot of fun i really enjoyed i would that say one. there was probably more than a handful of spots that were 73 inches yeah and yeah your 72 barely made it through yeah I'll, I'll admit to you i had razor envy we were the <laughs> they only were pretty nimble yeah i think uh, there was a wildcat out there we were the only can am maybe in that group i think, I we, think were, we were the only can am yeah uh tons of razors uh there was one turbo s and the turbo s was kind of bouncing off trees the way that i was but yeah. the, the but the 64 inch machines were just Easy peasy. All day long. All day. Yeah. Piece of cake. Just killed it. Yeah. There were some quads on that too in that group. Not um, only were there quads, there were quads with 60 year old grandmas driving it. You <laughs> that's know, true. and that's straight down. Yeah. Legit straight down. I was like, respect. Yeah. That's awesome. Those mountain girls, man. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that was a cool trail. I got to, got to do a great water, a uh, little alpine uh, creek yep. water crossing at the bottom of it and then drove down a river, you know, dr- down a runoff. Yeah. It had a runoff area yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah. That's where we got the most money. I think. I think so. Yeah. Conconally. You guys got to check it out. It's And that it, was on the, time. so there's a main road that goes out of Conconally up north and that was the west side of that road. Yep. And so uh, that trail ended up popping back out onto that road mm-hmm. um, where we popped out and we yep. went back to town for lunch at the, at the Lunch bar. and gas. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you were kind of just gauging also your fuel consumption. So right. we were preparing for another trip and you kind of wanted to gauge, you know, what you were getting gas mileage wise on the machine for these uh bdr and overland runs that we're doing i gotta have that information and uh mind you we took those readings on 30 inch tires the uh the the x3 doesn't have 30 inch anymore it's got 32s and they're a lot heavier um maxis liberty still yeah and it uh i think i did 15 almost 16 miles per gallon and that is, that's conservative on the throttle. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we weren't all over it by any stretch of the imagination. And we we're doing a lot of crawling. But one thing that we didn't do was a lot of idling. Yeah. We didn't sit there uh, idling for long periods of time. But, you know, most of the people I talk to on an, X, at an X3 that do keep track of their mileage, they're talking nine and 10. And I think what it is, is just, um, I think it's kind of a stable throttle, you know, a real uh, balance, you know, you're either all over the gas, full throttle, or you're off of it. And, you know, that sort of stuff can consume fuel really, really quick. I can, I, you know, I can tell you, um, not to spoil the fun, but I did some sand riding about a week and a half ago. I've never seen my X3 consume fuel like that. It was 90 <laughs> degrees out, and I was on my, I was on my scats. Yeah. And I went from a full tank to about a quarter tank inside of 25 miles. I was blown away. 
you were that was the first time you were actually out on loose sand the 100 percent, right and it, and it was about 95 degrees that day right so yeah. you were you were running hot as well yeah uh and you were at uh lower elevation i think too at that point isn't isn't that area lower than the mountains no i think it's up around 3500 or higher is it really yeah i think so oh, i thought it was warmer than that yeah, i'd there. have to check but mm. but uh that was basically the first loose sand and the biggest probably climbs you've done in a while and and on that machine yeah, it definitely was. Yeah. Definitely was. So uh, you went to St. Anthony yeah. in Idaho for the first time. Um, how was that experience? Uh, huge. Yeah, it's just, it's really, really big. It's, it's like, man, it's just hard to, it, it's a definitely like a proving ground out there. I didn't find anything out there that challenged the car. And I know I'm going to get flack for here for <laughs> saying that. And I'm not saying that negatively. I'm just saying that the car was just awesome. It just did a great it job. expectations. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was looking at lines that were debatable. I'm looking at them going, okay, if I have a problem, I've got an out and would just take them on. And even on some of the steepest cliffs out there, the car would hold its line and it would accelerate up those hills. And I, I was really impressed with that. But St. Anthony, St. Anthony is a place that I'm going to be tough to give you an opinion on until I've been out there more. And I absolutely want to be out there more. It was very, very cool. Um, the transition, there, there, there's, the one thing that I found is there's two lines. The big features out at St. Anthony, the one that people know across the United States, is Choke Cherry Hill and Devil's Dune, and they're very close to one another. There's a couple of lines I found to go out there. There's one that is almost a beeline straight there. You never hit any dune that's over, I mean, you're talking the biggest dune out there on that line is about the biggest so you would see it somewhere like Moses Lake. So, I mean, we're not even talking 30 feet. Look right over. Yeah. And then the other way to get there is to go duning. And that is the way that I recommend. I mean, the, the dune transitions from one peak to the next, you're blind. Effortlessly. You can't see. Yeah. You're jumping into the next dune. That's rad. It yeah. was absolutely rad. Like I, I, I had a lot of fun out there. The riding out there is spectacular. Um, I know a lot of guys in the Pacific Northwest, that's their favorite place to go. I'm not there yet. You know, Winchester Bay and Coos Bay are still my favorite, but I think that has a lot to do with the ocean and the trails. The trails out at St. Anthony, there's plenty, but you're blind on everything. You're really blind, actually. You know, and there's very, there, you know, a lot of the trails out there, they're not so sp spread out that you it's just a gut feeling that you have that you know you're going to run into people whereas a place like coos bay coos bay is just wide open it's just nothing but trails and there's some areas out there where you just pretty much know that you're the only one out there um st anthony's a little different in that regard but the actual dunes they're huge you know i was told that in terms of where we can ride they're the biggest dunes in the united states and that wouldn't shock me it was it was huge so when you're talking about comparing St. Anthony to, let's just say, Coos Bay and Winchester, because that's, you know, what we're used to riding and that's what's around us, the sand dunes, how do you, how do you compare them? So Coos Bay has always been told to me as not as big as Winchester, a little bit more in and out and technical, uh, whereas Winchester's more big and open and extreme. Is that accurate and then how would that compare to st anthony well there's there's like drop-offs in st anthony that uh if you were to have an accident and go over you're going to be rolling for a very long amount of time like the biggest dune out at winchester is pretty average out at st anthony and uh that's what i was thinking yeah, yeah. um that said they're hard to compare because you know st anthony is almost like the sahara it's like this open desert you'll see some rocky sections you'll see some uh some sections where some weeds and stuff have grown in a little bit but by and large all it is is dunes whereas winchester you're ducking around uh, foliage you're ducking around trees you're doing tree shoots um there's like these so little, there's a lot more yeah shrubbery and greenery there, there. there's a lot more there's a lot more obstacles there's a lot more features is what it is whereas st anthony is just flat out dunes i did find a jump you know, in terms of jumping, I love jumping on my motocross bikes. That's what I live for. Jumping on a side by side coming from a YXE felt sketchy. You know, you had to have a, the perfect lip on a YXE to, to get it to fly with any sort of consistency or feel like you're in good shape. I found a great jump dune. It was probably 10, 15 feet tall, and I was hitting it at about 50. And uh, it was 
the car flew great. So it was, it was fun to kind of check that off the list, get a little bit more comfortable doing right. that stuff and, and, and knowing that my car will fly well. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, St. Anthony is, it's all the, the only problem we're a long ways away from it, man. I mean, it's like yeah. 550, 550 miles, which it's the exact same mileage to Coos Bay from my house. It's 550 and 550. And I hate to say it, like if, if I'm flipping a coin or if I have to make the call between going to one of the two, I'm going to go to Oregon. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to I, argue with the ocean. Yeah. There's going to be events that are going to get put on at St. Anthony and we're going to be a part of them. And I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to getting more miles out there. It's unreal. You know, St. Anthony is unreal. Like when I was pulling up, I'm just looking straight up, looking straight up, just going, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is awesome. Yeah. You know, and the, and the car would take them on. So yeah. that, that was great. And eat, eat, eat the fuel along the way. Yeah, it did eat the fuel. <laughs> um, it, I did get one tip from a local and the local was saying, well, you're going to, you know, you're going to be riding at a time that you can't see. You know, you want to ride after 7 p.m., somewhere in there and before like 9 p- 9 a.m. During the day, you can't see a thing. It gets and, so flat. Yeah. And I got, I, you know, I went out there after work and, and it, oh my gosh, you can't see a thing. Like I had a couple <laughs> things sneak up on me and yeah. uh, it was no problem. You know, we, it, it was, it was no problem. I didn't get into any trouble or anything, but I totally can see what he's saying. The sand has a tint to it that unless you're wearing like some seriously polarized sunglasses or something, you may not see it. Well, or just the high contrast so that you're you're able to see the shadows right. and, and all that. Right. Because like in Winchester, you have, um, and sorry to all our East Coast and Southeast guys that we're talking about dunes again, but. Well, I wore my West Virginia hat for you. <laughs> that makes so, up for yeah. you. Uh, you know, you get out to Winchester and the and the, the wind off the ocean will, will soften the lips of all those witch eyes and they'll blend right into the next yeah. feature and you'll just fly right off of them because yeah. you'll never see the actual edge. But in, yeah, ask in, my brother. <laughs> yeah, he's done it. Um, but in St. Anthony is uh, it's not that's not the problem per se. It's it's the it's the angle of the light during midday, correct? That's, that's and the kind of doing and that. the texture or the color of the sand as well. Yeah, it, it, it's a combination of both. Is it a little bit more red out there? Mm, no, not really. No, no. It's uh, I would say it's almost a little bit lighter than uh, Winchester. Really? Yeah, but Winchester's is at the, at the right time. Winchester's got a lot of moisture in it. Yeah. 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 I would think that St. Anthony after a good rain or after it's been raining on an overcast day yeah. would be the best ride in America. Probably. I mean, it wouldn't shock me one bit. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to hear back from any of the guys in the in the community that have ridden maybe those two different dunes and maybe Glamis and, and all those and maybe compare them all. That'd, yeah. be, that'd be an interesting story. I, I did go up Choke Cherry and when you're staring up Choke Cherry, it's huge. Like it's very, very tall dune. But I'm looking at it going, oh, this is nothing. Yeah. yeah. And I went up it and my car took it down, you know, no problem. But going up it, like it was the, the, the sand was so fine and so powdery and so dry that I could feel the car starving for some power. Yeah. It wasn't starving for power, it was starving for traction. Right. And uh, when you get up on it and you park and you're in a downward angle, your car's sitting at a probably a 55 to 60 degree angle downhill. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. But Devil's Dune, Devil's Dune is incredible. I got a uh, I got a GoPro shot on Devil's Dune. Is that the one where you went up and over that yep. little ridge? Uh, I believe so. Well, Devil's Dune is this place that basically, like what I was doing, I'm not being a local, not being familiar with it, and being out there by myself. Like I'm looking up at this thing, going, "Okay, so here's my entrance point, here's my exit point." Went up and I hit it. I'm like, "Oh, it was a piece of cake." Then I looked again. Okay, I'm gonna go about twice as far this time. No problem. Then I wanted to go the full stretch. And that's a big dune. Like when you look at footage on Devil's Dune, when a side-by-side goes on it, it's being filmed from the other side, the approach side. The side-by-side literally looks like about a penny on your big screen right here. <laughs> yeah. Like it's tiny. And, yeah. and I went up it and the car just held the line like you wouldn't believe. But it is cool to go up a dune that's so steep at an angle and be pointing the car predominantly uphill and not and, going uphill. And not going You're uphill. You're just literally <laughs> drifting. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a cool feeling. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty fun watching those guys down south doing the drop-ins above the water and, yeah. and just hitting those lines all the way across. That's pretty, <clears throat> For pretty sure. entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do recommend it and we'll get, we'll get out there. You know, it's a, uh, it's a sight to behold though when you're approaching it because you're in farm country. Like, the road going into it is garbage. <laughs> it's total <laughs> garbage. It's like this county paved road that's just terrible. And you're just looking at this mass of sand in front of you. And like the uh, St. Anthony is right there. Rexburg is right there. But 
it, 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 it I don't know. It, it, it's a sight to behold. We'll just go with that. Yeah, and I think they just, uh, I think that this, this year they just put another side entrance into that area as well. So yeah, uh, I took a local's advice. Uh, Junior from Boondocker was telling me to park in this at this one particular lake, and uh, I, that's where I wound up yeah. going in from, and it was perfect. Yeah, I can't wait to go check it out. Um, you know, when we hit the Idaho BDR, that's going to be just just east of us and yeah. it'll be real tempting to go spend the day there but we have a lot of uh, mileage to cover on that trip so yeah you're gonna want to shave off some you know the next time I, w- I go out there i'm gonna take a lot of weight off that car yeah yeah because you were pretty much set up for for d- the trips we're doing for, off, so. for uh woods riding yeah so uh and and w- whenever you go to a new dune and a new area where there's lots of expanse to cover you want to give yourself a few days to yeah, and as much as I hate riding, uh, like I like to kind of discover things on my own. I just got to quit being stubborn and, and go out with a local. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. It's always better to do it. Oh, it is. It is. I just hate admitting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and for anybody that's new to dune riding, uh, it's just good practice to always go with somebody the first yeah. couple times to get kind of the lay of land and the rules and the how to operate around dunes because it's real easy to get stuck out there. It and, is. You know, Winchester is one of those places that if you're up in the air a little bit, you can see everything. So, yeah. you, you know, if you're lost, you can find a way back. You know, nighttime's probably a little bit different, but... We we know how that, that goes. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say something. Um, but like uh, St. Anthony is the type of place where it's the only dune riding I've ever done. And I know Glamis is like this because I've had people tell me, but you reference your GPS. That's It's that big. Yeah. You know. It, yeah, you get up funny. to the top and the next one looks like the first oh, one. Yeah. So I'm out there surfing dunes for 20 to 30 minutes. I'm like, well, they said Choke Cherry was only five miles away. And then I pull up and I'm not even halfway there because you just get <laughs> you just get too distracted by these cool you little carve features in and out and, and over and oh around. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh yeah. and that's what I love about Winchester. Winchester's got a lot of that too. Yeah, it's nice in Winchester to be able to pop up on top and, and reference the the ocean and the forest and yeah. kind of know where you're at. And they yeah. have some islands that are kind of identifiable in the middle of all the sand. So and by comparison, Winchester is maybe one tenth, maybe really that big. Ma- maybe one tw- honestly, maybe one twentieth the size of St. Anthony. St. Wow. Anthony's huge because uh, Winchester is like 5,000. Is it 5,000 acres? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd have to Google it. I'm not sure. And Coos is bigger than Winchester, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah, significantly. Yeah. So yeah, that uh, seems like a good time and I can't wait to get out there and, and yeah. rip that up. Yeah. Um, but to kind of circle back on Conconoli, we found some new other trails, found some awesome uh, lookout points. That mountaintop that we ended up on, Funk Mountain, you know, one of the best views I mean, if you you go north and we'll talk about it later, but there's some of the best views up there. My mind went right to your vlog where you're like playing like Parliament Funkadelic or something. Yeah, yeah. No, that was funny. Hopefully, some people picked up on that. That yeah. was pretty funny. But you know, that was a that was a. I I love lookout towers. How can you not? Yeah. And uh, that how was, was a cool that one. climb up the tower? Uh, it was slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't. I'm, I'll admit it. I don't do awesome with heights. And you combine heights with 40 mile an hour perpetual wind. <laughs> and wood splitting yeah. under your feet. Yeah, it was one of those things where I'm just like, I, am I over the weight capacity of this step? Well, you had a good uh, tester in That's front of you. That's why I so. sent you ahead of me, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a cool lookout tower. It'd been really cool to open up all those windows and kind of, you know, hang out there, maybe camp up there. That'd be awesome. For but, sure. Um, so good time up there. And then that that trail behind it going more north. Um was pretty pretty awesome once we got going and people started telling us to turn around yeah yeah (laughs) well what they told us is they told us there was this they had gone through this downhill section that was two to four miles long and it was nothing but mud and i'm like can we even make it up it and they're like yeah so we were naturally like we are absolutely going going up this yeah 100 percent. and i just pulled over just thinking to myself, because it was on the poker run going the opposite way. I'm like, right. dude, you were fighting traffic we're the whole not, way. You know, if we're on this, we're, if we're on this hill climb and we run into people, we're not going to be able to get turned around and I don't want to yeah. ruin their ride. And it's so. not safe for anyone at that no, point. No, no. We are absolutely going after that the next time we're up there. Yeah, for we sure. missed out on that trail. We yeah, need to go back. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm bummed. But I, I do think, I do think I found, um, by way of an accident, uh, an accident regarding my car and a component that I broke on my car <laughs> uh, while I was heading back to Conconoli, I do think I found the Did entrance to the northern port of that trail. Oh. I, th- I think I got it. So Yeah, so that uh, that part of the trail, um, 
started getting really kind of interesting and in, before we turned around now i will say once we turned around and um we had a gentleman staying with us and we met up kind of met up with him on that part of the trail yeah. um I'm trying to remember his name off the top of my head mike mike uh he was driving a uh razor rockin rock and, tw- rock and trails yep uh edition and that thing was i was flying ripping. yeah i was ripping he's running 33s too if i remember or was he running 35s i think there were 30 twos or Were threes they? yeah okay. yeah uh but uh clean car uh performed off uh effortlessly on the trails but following him so that trail was interesting getting up to the wa- the lookout tower but it was a whole lot more interesting going back towards it with him at full speed yeah he gets after it and uh I that was my first experience following an RZR and seeing how they corner in relation to my my can am like my Yamaha as long as I would keep my Yamaha on the power it'll go around that stuff left and right really well but enable to uh, in order to keep up with him the way that I wanted to keep up with him like you start drifting into that stuff on the can am to get it to get it cuz the, the turning radius just isn't what it was on right. that RZR and he was just throwing that thing around left and right cuz I mean we're talking hairpins we're talking 180s Back and forth, yeah. up and over, twisty through the trees, over the rocks. Love it. And I can I could foresee that trail being hands down one of the most fun things to do at full speed if you could have both ends closed off. Yeah. And just have guys say, "Hey, they're running. You're, you're clean. Go. Yep. Yeah. And like a you, rally, like yeah. a rally style. Yeah. Totally a rally course up there if you were able to to ride that way. I think the only problem that you would have with that is those drop offs. You know, somebody pr- could probably have an accident and oh I mean, for if, sure. And if they went off a drop off, I mean. A month later, they're probably still rolling. That's yeah. how that's how tall and steep that stuff is. But no, you're not wrong. That would be so much fun. Yeah, and if you're on a burnout side, you're going to get skewered the whole way down. Yep. So, oh no question. Uh, but anyways, that was an awesome trip. Uh, wish we could spend more time up there. Um, you know, we have uh, another podcast coming up where we cover our Washington BDR trip, which mm-hmm. includes some of that section of Conconoy up to the Canada border, um, which in its own right, has some of the most amazing views I think you can have in Washington um, with some of those overlooks and things like that. So I'm going to ask you a question. I won't tell people why I'm asking, but we'll cover that later. But before you get to Palmer Lake, there's a downhill mm-hmm. that goes to, to pavement in Palmer Lake. And it is uh, one of my favorite views on the BDR. Yeah, we stopped Did and took guys, pictures okay, cool. and, and yeah. all that. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. It is. I mean, you're, you're overlooking vineyards. And uh, apple orchards farms and, and just, vineyards and orchards. Yeah. And, and on one side, you have the lake. And on the other side, you have a Canada. valley where <laughs> you, know, you have the valley coming down. You can see through that valley. And, yeah. then, like, and then and the funny thing is like you're looking across it knowing that just on the other side of that is Canada. Yep. So uh, pretty awesome views. Um, one of those things where it's like you wish you could just sit there all day for the light to change so you could just take all the cool different pictures that end up happening. Um, drone operators dream out there. It is. Yeah, yeah. I, I I sent my drone out on it last year and uh, got some good shots off of it, and that was after the sun had set. So, uh, so look forward to that episode. We're going to be covering our Washington BDR trip in detail with those that are were on the trip, uh, as many of them as we can get on the on the show, and uh, talk about you know some of the fun points we had, the, the amazing views, and and the hurdles we had to jump across. Um, like you said, there was some breakdowns involved, um, on multiple machines Yeah, and, um, you know, that's just part of overlanding. You, you go, uh, in expecting to break things. The trail, uh, will ultimately it's, win. It's going to take a pint of blood. Yeah. No question about it. So, uh, lots of, uh, lots of interesting emotions flew through that trip. It was, um, it was, yeah, it was, it was challenging, but ultimately, you know, it's, it you've been on the trail now it's totally yeah. worth it <laughs> oh for sure and yeah. i would do it again in a heartbeat um now with a new perspective and uh yeah i I totally go do that trail again uh now with a new perspective and and it's really interesting as you go through we're so used to driving one terrain like you go to a trail system and you and you hit that trail and it all seems kind of the same or you go to the dunes and it all kind of is the same dune or uh whatever uh when you when you traverse an actual state you go from different geographic elements to others, different views, different trail systems, rainforest to desert to mountain to you know yeah. smooth to rocky to washed out to covered in tree fall, right. you know all those things. So definitely um, a different experience than the normal trail ride uh, that we're used to. So um, yeah, I do it get in a heartbeat, and, I, and if I could, I would probably take it a little bit slower 
and take my time to maybe stop, enjoy the scenery, get the, sh- get the photos, whatever. Yeah. Um, but there's some cool spots. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I was, um, I was driving it and leading the way once we got to a particular point. It, it's a lesson that I had to learn. It, the guys were, uh, one of the guys that we were riding with goes, you're holding what I like to call break stuff pace. Yeah. And I told him, I looked at him, I go, no, I'm holding what I call Yamaha pace. <laughs> but no, that trail. Well, you just know, for clarity. It's rough. Which ended up in breaking something. Oh, it, it did. It <laughs> did. That was a that was a pretty technical technical line, but nonetheless. It, no, it, I'm talking about your YXZ. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, you're, you're, you were holding the YXZ pace, but the YXZ still broke. Well, it, yeah, I took a tie rod out at 3,500 miles, and it happened to be on that trail, yeah. and it was due. You yeah. know, I, I feel I feel that it was due, and there's a fix for that for sure. But right. that was literally the only serviceable part or part that ever failed on that car. It was pretty tough. Yeah, you had pretty good luck there. Yeah, for sure. So uh, to transition, uh, we, after that, posted our KRX uh, first look. And uh, so that was pretty cool. Uh, shout out to Westside Motorsport in Spokane, Washington for hosting us. They let us have time and, and uh, hands-on experience with the car and got to drive it around their little test track to kind of, you know, get a feel for what the car was and how it handles and all that stuff. Um, we really rushed that day. We uh, we probably should have spent another two or three days filming that car. Yeah, we, we took a lot of stills and uh, the day kind of got away from us. At which point we started to do some some riding, a little bit of dynamic riding on the track that they had provided. But yeah, I would have liked to put maybe another 10, 20 miles on them. Yeah, and on a trail or something. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, going uh, back to that day, uh, the KRX, uh, Kawasaki's entry into the sports side-by-side market outside of their uh, long-lived Terex series, uh, the two and four. Um, this was their first purebred sport side by side and they came out with this uh a few months back or now almost a year now right yeah so uh they just recently released their 2021 models as well um which really didn't consist of much other than a blue uh version and a uh a rock and uh, a trails edition uh which is a good looking machine no no doubt about it um but it really didn't add much other than some graphics and a winch um so they really haven't changed anything for 2021. So if you're really interested in the KRX, uh, everything in our review was on a 2020 model, but nothing's really changed um, as far as motor, transmission, CVT, anything like that. So um, it is a thousand, well, it's not exactly a thousand, it's a 900 and some odd CC motor, right? Uh, but it has a centrifugal uh, clutch that is really, really smooth. Um, it has one of the best, biggest presences. How do you say that? Presence? It has the largest presence next to any other side-by-side factory OEM that I've seen. How did you feel about walking up on that car for the first the first walk up on that car? I mean, it was sitting next to a Talon at that point. Um, just just the presence of that machine, I feel, was demanding. Yeah, um, when we first got in it, like I I had set foot in it. I had uh, I'd seen I you know a few months in advance, like probably within about a month or two of it being released, I actually got to sit in it and stuff. And but this was the first time we ever did anything. But I, I agree with you. I love I love the lines. It looks aggressive. It looks like something that's ready to ta- take on the mountain. You know, yep. I, you know, if we're golfers like to use the term, uh, I don't, I can't remember the exact term, but it's basically the pleasant feeling that you get when you look down on a blade, when you look down on like a, a scoring iron or something like mm-hmm. that. Like you'll hear guys say it has to look good. I can't think anything on the KRX that checks off a box in a negative way in terms of the, the overall look of the car. I, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. It's very, um, I would say very much. Uh, in the vein of the original uh, 2019 Razor remodel, uh, redesign that they did. Uh, and I think that if they were to continue that design language, it's exactly what the KRX looks like. Uh, just more exaggerated, more aggressive, more everything. So it definitely has a, much, a very Predator-esque look to it, um, which I really enjoy. Um, but it's a, it's a big car. It is a very big car, and it feels like a big car too once, yeah. you, once, you, once you're behind the wheel and start moving it. So the cab, getting into it, spacious, roomy. There's like six to eight inches right behind the seat just from the get-go with the seat all the way back. Like you have extra storage back there. And if you're a shorter person and you sit further forward, you could fit a cooler back there. And I've seen pictures of it. Yeah. So uh, the cabin 
has a uh, skin doors. Everything feels very creature comfort esque. Has the right the right cup holders. Has all that stuff. Has a parking brake, which I thought is interesting. So it doesn't have a park uh, gear. It just goes neutral, and you you pull the brake up. That took me a little to get used to. Uh, I probably left it in, left it engaged um, more than three times. Yeah. Um, uh, plenty of headroom. The cage looks good. Um, there's some funny triangles at the front A pillars that, if you don't have a roof or anything, kind of stand out to me. Uh, but I'm pretty sure almost all Terex owners are going to have a roof and, and maybe some accessories up there. Um, but uh, it has good Fox uh, suspension on it. Um, the It doesn't have tender springs. It has dual rate springs. So that's a nice plus. A lot of the guys from the, the Razor land will uh, appreciate that change if they're looking at buying one. 15-inch rims, bead locks, um, using the Maxxis Carnivore 32-inch tires. Um, 32 or 30s? What did I say? I think it's 30s. 30s, yeah. So it's got the standard Maxxis package that everybody's using right now uh, on their OEM cars as far as tires go. But the wheels look good. They have a color match beadlock ring. All looks great. Um, I think everybody should come with beadlocks, but that's just me personally. Uh, they're more work and everything, but you can also just swap the tire at home and and you know put the put the dune paddles on and and move on, right? Yeah. So um, you know, as far as quality, build of materials, everything felt top notch. The doors had a little bit of a um, I don't know, like kind of just a they just didn't click in and meet correctly the outside skin the inside skin felt like maybe they overlapped a little bit if you squeezed them i can see where you're going with that but i still loved them yeah there was really i I didn't feel bad about it i was just like oh and the the reason i loved them i loved how they look but and the other thing is too this is going to sound petty arm placement oh yeah i call it it, the arm ability score that's what it is man it's like when (laughs) it was uh it's set up it's set up it almost feels like the car set up to cruise (laughs) oh for for I believe it is. I think yeah. they did. I think they actually knew about that kind of feel that they were going for. Yeah. I think that the um, the Kawasaki team is very underestimated on their ability to read their customer base, and I think that they knew that they're looking for a car that can feel comfortable and spacious and powerful and capable, and that's all the things that this car is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would have no hesitation in any obstacle or situation to run that car outside of a very off camber obstacle. And even at that, I, I, I would feel totally confident in that thing. Um, we can go back to Conkin only. We had a ton of off camber type corners and stuff. When you're looking at it, you're just going, oh, this is going to feel weird. And my mm-hmm. car just didn't have any feedback on it at all. Like this right. is nothing. Could be the same thing on that thing. I, I kind of get where you're going. Like I've heard people say that it feels top heavy. Yep. It didn't feel too top heavy to me. It did push, you know, a little bit, but uh, but outside of that, it, it it felt it felt pretty balanced. So riding the KRX, I shouldn't say riding the driving the KRX. It feels very floaty. It has a very Cadillac 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 Cadillac. Cadillac. There we go. Cadillac esque feel to it. To where it waterbed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like things just kind of get smoothed out a little yeah. bit. The, the responsive or the, the the driving feedback through the steering wheel isn't quite there. Um, and so the reason that is is because, one, it's a very heavy car. Um, it's also a very tall car. So there's lots of clearance. There's lots of wheel and suspension underneath you to whereas on a lot of cars, you sit next to the suspension. On this one, you sit above the suspension. And so all those things combined... Um, can have a very top heavy effect so a lot of people talk about the razors being easy to roll over and i attribute that to more of just people not understanding the difference between the turbos and the fox suspension on their live valves versus the walker evans on the lower end series having less dynamic range of adjustment and them going into it full soft you know in four wheel drive and then tipping them over um so the krx is even more top heavy than than those machines um and so i would say that driving it was a very comfortable experience in the way that I would drive a Cadillac and feel very comfortable. Right. Um, it's not comfortable as in like a BMW where everything's tight and stiff and you can go into the corner and feel confident. It's, it's more of just a, I'm going to enjoy this experience yeah. and, and spend all day just kind of just relaxing. There are side by sides, as everybody knows, that feels like a sports car. And this is kind of a happy medium to a degree. Yeah, for to sure. To a degree. Yeah, I think that, you know, whatever it is that you might complain about it not feeling aggressive enough could be tuned, tuned to the point to where you enjoy it. But like I've said, I said this day of, and I still maintain this within 50 feet of driving this car, I felt my first thought was, oh, I get it. 
Yeah, I totally get it. Yep. With the exception of some Polaris models, I've never been in a side by side that steered easier. Mm -hmm. I've. This is fact. I mean, you've got companies out there like Pedal Commander, and my car could warrant a Pedal Commander. When you're going through the chop, the throttle gets punchy you yeah. know as your foot vibrates you know around there. yeah as your foot vibrates around with the terrain you know the car is going to herk and jerk and this that and the other you can put my car into rock mode and it'll still it'll still do it honda the same way honda's real herky jerky there is none of that on a k on the krx the krx was so smooth on mm -hmm. its throttle yeah the the power ramp on the on the throttle by wire that yeah. they're all using now uh everybody gets to tune their own ramps right and Kawasaki has definitely taken the very uh, smooth and slow, steady race to get to the top. And then once it gets to about 60, 70%, then it just takes off, yeah. right? And so, and it doesn't take off like in an abrupt way. It takes off in a very smooth and, and understandable method. Um, but that to get to that point, it's a very slow ramp up. Yeah. And, and that, that tends to throw somebody that's a performance-minded sport enthusiast off. Um, you're coming from the X3 with the Evo Stage 3 tune. Uh, I'm coming from turbos and, and all that stuff. You're used to being able to just tap that, just to wrap that pedal and, and get going. Whereas on this, it's more like put your foot on it and get into it. That's, and that's how it feels. Like when you look at the, sp the speedometer often would tell me a different story because the, the track that we drove on had a straight stretch on the back that was choppy. Um, the car wasn't affected affected by that chop whatsoever i don't think it even knew it was there and go yeah exactly and going into the the corner which was a hairpin 180 i would look down at the speedometer and the other car that we were testing that day i was holding the same speeds you know and i mean it's, it's and it felt of, completely different it all oh, 100 different night yeah. night and day different and i'm not saying good bad or indifferent just different yeah. but it's a uh it's a very it's just an unbelievably smooth car mm -hmm. i mean we just got done talking about uh, Conconally. Mm -hmm. How would you feel about driving that thing up there? All day long, All every day. All day long. Yep. Yep. And I mean, I've. <laughs> if you go to our first vlog, uh, the first official vlog we did, it was centered around a Winchester Bay trip. Yep. And I, I take a look. There, there's a vlog that Zach did that says ripping the dunes. And it's it's our Oregon trip. At the tail end at of the- At the tail end of winter. <laughs> at the tail end of the first vlog- we are at a Dairy Queen, and you can look at me, and I look like a zombie. Like, I yeah. look like a corpse. I was so beat up that day. We'd done so much driving to get there, and then we went out and ripped. The center of my back between my shoulder blades couldn't have hurt worse from riding, and it just felt like somebody would hit me with a train. There would be none, none of that in this no. car. <laughs> now, that like being You could said, ride this car all day and just yeah. piece of cake. That being said, uh, in that context, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a dune machine. It, I've seen footage of that thing out at Pismo. Mm -hmm. uh, the rugged radio guys put put that thing on some uh, on some paddles, and it performed really really well, man. But oh, I mean, sure. but Pismo doesn't have, you know, there's no 300 foot dunes out there, right? Yeah, but I would say it the, wouldn't be my choice for dunes. It wouldn't I, be my choice, yeah. especially if you're someone that likes to carve, right? Um, you're gonna find that you're gonna feel very uncomfortable in some of those tippy situations and then the other situations are those situations where you need to deliver the power instantly to get yeah. out of the trouble spots where you get on a off camber sand dune or something where you're not expecting to go sideways but you end up going sideways and you need to throttle out of it um where your where your low end torque and, and speed is all your friend this is not going to achieve the same responsiveness that a turbo or a, uh, a can am or, or something more more suited for that kind of riding would would do yeah probably six months ago we did a podcast around what machine would you buy and we built it around certain applications mm -hmm. there's certain applications where this car is going to creep into my dialogue this car is going to be right next to razors for Absolutely. me as far as recommendations yeah. go yeah I, I i mean as far as like the overland thing that we like to do this would be a great car for that. Wouldn't this be an awesome it, overlanding car? It really wouldn't this be an awesome four seater overlanding it, car? It might legitimately be the best. Yeah, yeah. And I, that, I could that, see this yeah. thing just tr just all day long, just going destroying expedition. miles. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, one thing about the the KRX, it has a larger uh, secondary and primary clutch system, so the sheaves are are actually physically wider in their diameter than than that most cars are. Um, their belts are thicker and longer than all the other cars. And that, on top of everything else that they've, they've put into that car, makes it for a very uh, a low-end torquey, very responsive uh, in the low-end car, whereas on the high-end, it's kind of all one note. 
Like once you get there, you're there and you stay there and it all sounds the same and you don't really vary off of it very much. So one thing I did notice is the exhaust note on the car um, was a little bit tinny, tinny, a little bit more of a raspy one notey like it on a on a well-tuned razor or X3. It has a very throaty kind of sound to it. And the KRX had a very just like one note, very consistent, like just noise. And uh, I, I don't think it was bad, but at high speed, if you're someone that goes at high speed all the time, I I could see where that would be yeah. something where you want music or earplugs or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot to say uh, in from a negative standpoint about this car. Um, I don't know that I've been in the interior of a side-by-side that was more comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Those seats. I, I mean, I'm 6'4", you're 6'3". I'm 6'2". You're 6'2". And All torso. Yeah. This thing is, uh, I, I felt great. Yeah. Ton, tons of room. Uh, everything that I wanted to be adjustable was, and I was comfortable as a passenger too. Even the passenger seat felt great. So those seats in that car have a very rubbery uh, material uh, inside the cushion instead of a foam. Um, and I found that way more comfortable than a lot of the stock seats out there. Um, and the material that they use to wrap their seats is a more of a, uh, a dirt bike skin material. Straight up is. It's a lot more grippy. Um, so I could find, I could see how that material would benefit you in trail, uh, back bouncing back and forth where you feel a little bit more planted to the seat. Um, and they, they hugged you fine. They're what they weren't like extremely well bolstered, but at the same time they were super comfy. So uh, a lot of times you, you sacrifice comfort when you get a bolstered seat, uh, just because of how tight it gets or how, how it wraps around you and the body shape you have. Yeah. And I didn't find any of those inconveniences with the stock OEM seats. Now, what I did find annoying, and this is one of my gripes, is that the be- the the seats were not removable. The bottom cushion was removable, but the the entire seat frame and back cushions has to be drilled out. Were bolted on. Bolted yeah. So while you could adjust them forward and backwards, you couldn't just remove the seat like you would in a razor or a Can Am or or whatever. So um, the reason I see that as a big negative is because you have so much storage behind the seat. There is anywhere between six and a foot of space between the firewall and your seat that you're going to want to utilize, especially if you're going overland, especially if you're going camping, things like that. Or if you want to do audio or if you're doing a speaker system, I mean, (laughs) outside of their outside of their package system, you know, um, I could definitely see guys, Oh, throw in some tens behind the seats and stuff like that. Oh, Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm dumb, man. Does that thing have an alternator? Uh, it does have an alternator, I believe. Um, it, it might be the def- it might be an audio contender. Then. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me let me restate that. They have a built-in stator with an alternator upgrade option. Got it. Like a factory alternator Got option, it. so you can upgrade to a full full on uh, full blown alternator. Yeah, I should know that. My bad, guys. So, um, if you are going to be running a lot of light or a stereo system, things like that, I would highly recommend getting the alternator kit, unless you're going to be always submerging the car in mud, and then stay away from that. We we can you know in terms of driving this car, believe it or not, we actually got them airborne, and uh, I wouldn't say airborne like Al Macbeth airborne, but airborne. <laughs> I don't think any, much of anybody gets no, Al nobody Macbeth gets airborne. Al, Al Macbeth airborne. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we we did we were able to throw it into some corners yeah. as well. Um, you know, if we want to get if we want to be super uh, objective and critical, you know, the more dynamic that, that you threw, uh, the more dy- dynamic the riding you did. If you're in a straight line, if you're talking about whoops, I felt really, really confident in the car. It felt great. Um, I did throw it into some corners where you felt a little bit of push, nothing that wasn't easily adjusted. In jumping the car, I felt like the car was totally fine, like it'll do it, but it wasn't like pumped about it. <laughs> like, right. I, can't, I don't have really have anything negative to say about it. Like it flew. And that goes back to the throttle response. Yeah, you don't have it, the power instantly. To... Yeah. It, it flew well. It landed okay. You know, there's no big bash or anything like that. But, you know, in terms of the overall riding, you know, going left and right, you definitely want to have a plan for it. You're going to feel what it's capable of throwing it into some, into the twisties, but you know, no, nothing really negative to say about it. If there's one thing based on what Zach was saying in terms of how the power tends to roll on, on this thing, like when I attack a corner, there's times I'll just throw it into the corner. There's times I'll, there's times I will, I'll throttle into the corner. I'll drift into the corner. If you're, if you have a tendency to really want to get that thing, all four wheels turning, uh, and drifting, that's probably not where it's going to shine. Right. You know? Yeah, definitely. I, w- I was going to say that, 
when I was looking back at some of the video from that day, there were times where I could have sworn I never got off the ground and I had. Yeah. Because the car yeah. is so smooth going up and over and, and landing that you just never even felt it. Yeah. Now, mind you, and we're going to cover this on a later podcast, but the other car that we tested that day was the best jumping car I've ever been in. Like in terms of once it left the ground and how it landed and the, and the predictability, the best I've ever driven in. So jumping into this thing, it felt a lot different. Not something that shook my confidence in it, but it felt just it, it just felt like that wasn't really what it wanted to do. And you this know? was all in context of the testing track we were on. So yeah. I mean, we we didn't really get a chance to throw it at the dunes or at any kind of like structured jumping. Yeah. But uh, but it was definitely a unique feel to go between those two different worlds, and especially coming from the Razor on my side and having the experience in your X3, uh, just how sport focused that is. And then going between something that was super comfy, yeah, comfy and 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 luxury feeling, to something that was like totally like a caged animal, yeah. You know, if we'd have attacked that track on my X3 with its 30s, it would tell you about every bump that you hit. Mm -hmm. It's super choppy. The steer you're going to get a lot of steering wheel feedback. Now that I have my 32s on there and the offset isn't set up properly, it would just beat the crap out of you. And this car, the Kawasaki, nothing. Just it's like. It it's so well set Cadillac. up. Cadillac, yeah, for sure. I would, I would venture to say that if I were to buy one today, I would probably buy it with or with a package deal of 32s or 33s that yeah. go on it, just because that is the more natural setup for that car. But as far as an OEM stock setup, that car is, is if you want, if you have back problems or if you have just the the need to um, not get jarred all the time by the driving experience, and you're just simply out there to have a good time. We're talking about millions of people that want yeah. to get into the sport. Yep. And this is your car. For sure. Based on what you were just saying. It is. I, I'm very confident about saying that. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Like I have a neighbor that has literally had a back issue that he can't go experience off-road in any capacity. Could do it in that. But he would, I bet you if he sat in that car, he would buy one in a heartbeat. Yeah. yeah. So um, just a couple other little features just to go over real quick. Uh, I thought the oil site was a pretty cool feature, um, being able to see your oil level and all that. But uh, there's some education that goes into that. I mentioned it in the article, uh, as well as the video review where we um, talk about how people just naturally start getting more information overload. They're getting color and viscosity is you know information from the site glass and then they have questions about it so uh, just get educated if you're looking to buy one of these that you're going to freak out a little bit the first month when you see the oil in this thing so there's lots of discussions around it go check it out uh, get yourself informed um, and the other thing i really liked uh, about the carex outside of the cabin was the the bed i thought it was very spacious yep and i was up in that thing standing on it and i'm a big guy and there was no flex. There was no deviation from its form. The, the the structure underneath it was perfectly great. And I think that car would be just absolutely a no-brainer for loading out uh, cargo, you know, camping supplies, anything that you wanted to throw at it, as well as that it's fully capable of holding um, a full-size factory spare. So yeah. um, that's always nice as well. Yeah. Another thing worth noting is where it's at today from an MSRP standpoint. When it came out, it was roughly about twenty. I want to say twenty twenty thousand nine ninety nine. Does that sound about right? Uh, I think so. I think it was thirty twenty two. But yeah, yeah. Uh, you can pick these up in some parts of the country as low as sixteen. That's a, there's a lot of value for that at, yeah. at sixteen. That's just you're you're getting such a good car. Uh, we're actually looking at it, uh, a picture right now, and it's it's showing one of my favorite things about the car from a legroom standpoint. From a, for a taller guy. It has a dead pedal on the left for the driver, and some dead pedals are pushed way too close to the driver. Like uh, the first one that comes to mind and the worst I've ever been in is a Textron Havoc X. That dead pedal almost had my knee to my stomach. The The dead pedal and the, um, and the overall basically like accelerator, brake pedal, and the ability to stretch your left leg out when it's appropriate – there's a reason I'm saying that this is one of the most comfortable, if not the most comfortable machine I've ever sat in. Yeah, I, I personally felt like maybe it was a little bit too close, uh, but that's because I'm always on that ever never-ending quest to have my dead pedal foot with the same position my driving foot is, right. which is same always in the, in the pedal. So it's always past that point, that plane. So, um, But the nice thing is that both sides have the same 
dead pedal. Um, the uh, to get both feet on the passenger side over to the full length where you're stretched all the way out. Um, it felt a little bit cramped just because of the wheel well situation because the wheel wells on the KRX are huge and massive. Um, but the other thing that I found interesting was that the, the dash was very molded for things. Yeah. But there was nothing there. You saw the work that we had to do on my X3 to get all the accessory ports built. Like we ordered a flat out, totally custom center console. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at the Kawasaki, it already has the room to do anything you want. Yeah. Like right. Yeah. I mean, what it's we a just canvas, yeah, really. It is. What we just did on the X3, you would not have to do on this. It's set up. And and the great thing is Kawasaki came out of the gate with tons of accessories that you can put into this dash or onto the car. And you're not going to have to worry about customizing or, or fabbing anything up. It's, yeah. They have it ready from the get go. Yeah. I loved its steering wheel. Um, one of the biggest complaints that I have that I plan on doing something about on my Can Am is I absolutely loathe. <laughs> the stock steering wheel, I hate it. And uh, the KRX has a steering wheel is very, very much like the YXE. Very comfortable, big enough. I it love felt it. very kind of tack- tacky and grippy and yeah. a little bit squishy. Would you agree that uh, in terms of how it turns and the effort that it requires to turn that car, really the only thing I think that's comparable is a Polaris, is a Polaris-based product? I would say that it's maybe a small magnitude better than the Polaris. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that also plays back to just the fact that they had the bigger tires than I'm used to and right. all that stuff. So, um, yeah, steering experience was great, uh, adjustable up and down, you know, to a pretty extreme level. I have a picture on the website of, um, you know, adjusting the steering wheel, um, up and down. You can pretty much fit anybody's driving style at that point. Um, the driver's view in the cockpit is, is pretty, pretty open except for the, the wheel wells are, um, pretty substantial and they yeah. stick up quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. We were actually t- uh, discussing that in real time while we were sitting in it, wondering whether or not we liked it or not. And I think it was determined that it didn't bug us at the time. Mm-hmm. It was just obvious, but it didn't bother us. I would say that, you know, the, every machine's going to have its quirks and every quirk is going to have its base of people that say it's fine or not fine. Um, and if I were to be a, a UTV purchaser right now, and I was seriously looking at a KRX, there's literally nothing on that car that would deter me from buying that car. Nothing. So, um, th- the only thing that would deter me from buying a KRX is if I was a sport driving enthusiast that comes from a different car that maybe had more horsepower, more throttle response, something like that, um, which I am. And so if I were to put money down today, I would be hesitant to drop it on a KRX, just knowing my driving style. Yeah. I'm, but I, I'm a one car owner. Like once I get done with a build and I run it for a couple of years, it's not very practical for me to hang on to the car. You know, I used to have two dirt bikes on my buddy who would have one to ride. I don't really feel the need to do that. It's, it's an asset. I'll move it, jump into a new project. So the KRX for what I do from an overall standpoint is probably not the machine for me just because of how much sand I ride in. Um, but there's so much, so many places that I ride where this thing would be absolutely appropriate. And if I had any negative criticism to say, I would just want it to be a little torquier. That's all. A little torquier, a little come on a little harder. Yeah. You know, because that's going to get that, that's going to get that action in the corners that I like, you know, to get the car turned around the way that I like. But, uh, you know, going through the, down the list of the, it checks off so much. I was really impressed with the car. And there's some companies out there right now doing aftermarket cages for this thing that make it just, just brutal. Oh, it looks so good. Yeah. <laughs> now, now if you, we're looking at a picture of the side by side of the KRX right now, that is a side view, the profile of it, right? If you were to build a custom cage and build it all the way back to the back. So you had a cargo rack built in and everything. It was all just this continuous lines. Mm-hmm. How bad would that look? Oh, now, there's a few people doing it. We'd have to dig dig up on, uh, there's some people on Instagram that are doing stuff like that. But, you know, in terms of cages, I've never worked with a, a, like a cage developer. I've worked with builders mm-hmm. and, and, you know, you could, you could do anything you want with that thing. You got the room to do it. You got the real estate to do it. And man, for a couple of dudes that are pretty tall, like, like you and I are, we had some serious headroom in that car. I, so, so you, if you, you look at a Polaris, uh, their, their, their OEM cages, like literally look like a mountain going up and over to yeah. the back seats yeah. or whatever they they have tons of headroom. And if I put a roof on that, I would still, wearing a helmet, would always bump into that. Really? In this car, I would never bump my head. Yeah. The cage is that tall. And because the car is already big and already tall, like the cage just makes it look even bigger. Yeah. But, so, it's, but it's not gaudy. Or it's anything. not. It's not horrible at yeah. all. And 
it could afford to lose six inches of headroom and still be okay and still be good. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. You mentioned that because the OEs, I, I've noticed that like the one that sticks out the most is the new Pro XP. Yep. Um, I've, I've seen pictures of Travis Pastrana in a Pro XP and he probably has eight to 10 inches of headroom while he's wearing his helmet and Travis Pastrana is six foot three. Is he? Yeah. I thought it was a shorter guy. No, he's a big guy. Huh. Yeah. It just, it, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because yeah, I've noticed that some of these cages are pretty, the, pretty big. It, yeah. And the interesting thing is that like on a Polaris, you sit kind of upright, kind of in midway in the height spectrum. A Can-Am, you're sitting down low and far back. On the Pro XP, you're sitting pretty low and far back uh, in comparison to the doors and everything else. In this car, you're sitting pretty high. It's a very trucky feel, right? That like a lot of the Polaris guys like. Um, and it could afford to be lowered and it could be afford to give it a little bit of a lean back. It is a little trucky feeling. It wasn't as trucky as like in the Pro XP. That felt like I was driving a semi, but not in a really? bad way. The Pro? Oh man. I was, thinking, I was thinking the general. Yeah. You should, you've been in a Pro, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. No, I, I felt like that thing was just totally upright. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really the nice it. thing about the Pro, though, is you can set it back because it does have yeah. multiple adjustments on the seats. To where it'll drop? It'll be just like a Can-Am where oh, you, cool. you can be back for days. Yeah. Very cool. Um, but what I was going to say is I totally forgot about this. You remember we were sitting in the in the KRX talking about it? Yeah. And I told you the seats felt like they fell backwards as it got taller. Like I felt like I was coming away from the seat on my shoulders, whereas my lower back was firmly planted. Um, and... I'm, I'm just now remembering this. When I was sitting in there grabbing, grabbing the steering wheel, the steering wheel wasn't like far away from me. It wasn't like extended to a point where it was the wrong setting. I was sitting in the, in the KRX noticing that my shoulders were coming off the seats. And that's because the bolstering disappears and it becomes to a point at the top. Um, so if you're somebody that feels like you need to be firmly planted top to bottom in the seat, um, the stock the OEM seats might feel a little weird to you um, at that point. Now, if you're if you're that if you're a person that's to that degree of like figuring out how I feel in a machine, you're probably going to be replacing the seats anyways. Yeah. So I won't really worry about it. But uh, it, it's just something I just I just off the top of my head re- remember experiencing. Yeah. We're looking at a picture of the car directly front on, and I'd be hard pressed to think of an OE car that looks that good and that aggressive from the front. It looks fantastic looks so probably sick. the best face on the on yeah. the market right now yeah and the big joke was when it came out was that it was the kawasaki rzr yep <laughs> yeah i mean and there's there's some i i want to say the rear suspension is probably the biggest similarity but like when you're looking at it from dead from front on it's a very attractive rig uh yeah they did a great job on the headlight design i like this oh, the for split sure. look with the, the the running light down the middle yep um the, speaking of the rear end uh it does have a four link so it does have dual radius rods in the back, but it has a third one in front of the uh, in front of the uh, hub. So it does help with a tow. And another thing that I didn't really realize while we were shooting the car and driving the car, and I kind of uh, was reminded of it when I was watching the shock therapy videos when when um, Justin was talking about the KRX suspension. The upper arms are shorter than the lo- lower arms. Yeah, it's to it's to move it. Like, yeah, so the in a, in a curve a little bit as opposed to like so my the, car, which is horribly wrong. Right. So the <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the during the the travel of the suspension when it's at midpoint is straight up and down. Right. And on the KRX, because of the lower of the shorter upper arms, uh, it bec- it becomes a S curve on the camber. So as it goes up, it toes it cambers out, and then as it comes down, it does it again. And so that shape on, on many cars is kind of a circle. Like mm-hmm. it, it goes from top to bottom in a, in a curve because they're just two linear points like this. Uh, on the KRX, because of the shorter upper arms, it, it cambers out on the top and then it comes straight and then it cambers out on the bottom at your full droop as well. We will see in about two to three years whether or not Cowie gets copied. Yeah. You know, because I, I think they got that right. I, I think that's a great setup. Yeah. Um, if you were to listen to Robbie Gordon, uh, he would say it's just as crappy as everything else. But um, uh, he <laughs> did he actually his, say that? Oh yeah, uh, I oh, missed yeah. it. So he has his uh, he has his opinions, and he's building his speed UTV the way he thinks it should be yeah. built. So um, that's but, another uh, topic altogether. <laughs> um, and, I don't and mean we, that in a bad way. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting excited. We'll just go with that. <laughs> um, and uh, we've we've talked about speed a lot, but I I I just wanted to call that out. Just 
everyone has their points of view on suspension. Um, I think Kawasaki did a great job on their car. Um, and I would say that if you're in the market for a UTV, don't hesitate on taking one for a test drive. Yeah. 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 West side Honda has been in Spokane Who? for uh, West. Well, oh my gosh. That's how old I am. As I call it <laughs> West side Honda. Cause that's what it used to be called. Ian just dated himself. I know, well, I'm, I'm a dated man. Yeah. Uh, West side's been on the West Plains of Washington for years. And I've done, I've done a ton of business with them dating back to my moto days. They're, they're fantastic. And man, they just let us do whatever we wanted. Just let us rip this thing as well as the other car. And we'll, yeah. we'll have some content up on that one, but it was, uh, it was a great day. Yeah. Westside was accommodating. They let us come through and do whatever we wanted. And, yeah. Uh, we had to operate within business hours, which was, you know, kind of a thing, but, um, no, no qualms there. I've bought uh, parts for my kid's dirt bike there yep. and, and they, they service all, is there a model they don't, uh, carry or service there? Uh, they don't, well, and with side-by-sides, no, uh, they, 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 they pretty they much carry everybody. All. Yeah. 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 In terms of, uh, like quads and stuff. They don't have Suzuki on their lineup, but mm, yeah, I yeah. mean, they, they have everything from BMW, you know, in terms of bikes, they don't have uh, KDM or Husky, but yeah, they, they sell everything. Yeah. Yeah. They, they pretty much have everything there. They're a full dealership with side-by-sides, quads, uh, motorbikes, adventure bikes, dirt bikes. And that's uh, their bread and butter from when you walk in there. You would think that bikes are their bread and butter for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The whole floor is covered in them. It is. And then uh, they also have like watercraft and yeah. three-wheeled motorcycles and um, just all sorts of stuff there. And let's talk about this a little bit. The industry uh, going into COVID, right? We were all uncertain. All the brands were uncertain on what was going to happen. We went out to West Side and filmed these cars, uh, the KRX and the other one that we'll, we'll get to I know on a later episode. <laughs> and how many cars were there? Like if you look at the... It was packed. There was a commercial spot that we do on yeah. these videos that you can go back and look. There was literally hundreds of cars there. And there were five KRXs there. Or more. I think yeah. there was like 10. Yeah. And uh, the whole lot was covered in UTVs for all the different makes and models. Right. You're talking about sports side-by-sides, utility side-by-sides, um, Rangers, Generals, Defenders, uh, KRXs, Terexes. Uh, I think there was even a John Deere or something there that somebody had traded in. Like there was just tons of UTVs there. You go there today and it's hard pressed to see more than one of anything. Yeah. And, and it's not because they're a bad dealership. Yeah. It's because they're selling that many vehicles. It's most of the stuff that's coming in, especially that's sport orientated, is already sold. Yeah, I mean, I think you were there, and they had one of the the Orange Madness Polaris Pro XPs yep. come in. They they pulled it right to the front of the building. It sold while I was there. Yeah, I mean, how crazy has the industry gotten to where we can get cars into the shop and have them sold before they get fully assembled? Yeah, I I went. I was at another dealership just making like a normal sales call, and I was surprised because they had two Pro XPs, um, one four seater, one two seater. Both were sold. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't go near them. Couldn't touch them. Yeah, it, the, the industry is nuts right now. Nobody has inventory, you know. And, and, and the that used goes, market, the used market, as soon as a used car goes up, it's you probably sold within twenty four hours, if not quicker. I had a gentleman I was talking to last week that has um, a, uh, I think it's a four seater Turbo S that is, uh, I think, two years old now. I mean, it's fully built and and all that. And somebody offered, I think, thirty six for it, just to buy it straight off them. And it's got you know thousands of miles on it and everything else. It's like what other time in history have you been able to get more than OEM cost on a machine that is very, very uh, <laughs> negatively impacted after you buy it? Yeah. I mean, uh, the car industry is, is pretty bad. You buy something off a lot, it's going to depreciate. And unless you have a collector car, it's not going to ever sell for over what it's asking, right? And you go into an, a throwaway sport where if you wreck the car, you throw it away, buy a new one. I don't think there's ever been a time where you can buy a car for more or sell a car for more than what you paid for it after you've already thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it. The industry is going nuts right now. Everybody's feeling it. Everybody's seeing it. It's just, you know, there isn't a, there isn't a day that goes by the thread that pops up or somebody's asking, you know, what's the best place to, I mean, to get a deal or and it, those were the questions that were 90 days ago. It's now now it's who has stock. Beginning of the year yeah. it was who's going to give me the best price. Yeah. And now it's everybody's paying MSRP. Who's got it? Yeah, right. And how fast can I get it? So um, it'll be interesting to see how the industry adapts to that going yeah. into the next season because we're coming out of a full year of basically no events, but yet the biggest sales records in in the industry. 
So next year, we're going to be going into event season with a whole new generation of of drivers. It wouldn't shock me one bit of a place like Takeover that normally normally would see fifteen to twenty thousand people at Coos Bay. It could be almost five to ten thousand more than that next year. Yeah, I mean, it, it just wouldn't shock me. It's going to be one of those things where if we do like an Airbnb or a um, uh, a hotel, I be the first one to admit it. Like when I go into those events and stuff and I book a hotel, usually I do it the week before I go. You're going to get, you're going to, you're not going to have, you're that not going to have that next year. Yeah. I mean, people are, if, if they come up with a vaccine for this and it works and uh, the COVID scare comes to a close or just the election, it's just going to, yeah, something, <laughs> it's just going to go nuts next year. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. It's yeah. going to be a, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be an interesting time for, for everybody, the community, the, the brands, the yeah. manufacturers, everybody's going to be kind of in a unique new world going into next season. All right. So anyways, uh, it's been great to get back in the studio with you. Yeah, man. Um, this has been an awesome time. Uh, I've been jonesing to be at the desk again and talking and, uh, you know, just doing what we do on the podcast. We just spent a little over an hour talking about an awesome car. We both gave it the thumbs up. It's just one of those things, man. If you're on the market for something, take take it, take this thing into consideration. I was really impressed with it. Yep. So just to reiterate, if you're in the market for a UTV and you're a, uh, someone that likes to chill and have a great time, check out the KRX. It's an awesome machine. Don't let the haters say that it's not pow- not enough power for you. Um, it's more than enough power. It's just a matter of how you get there. So, That's right. Um, thoroughly enjoy the car. I'd have one in my driveway if I could today um, in, in just the capacity of what that machine can do. I think it's also a very capable platform to build off of. So if you're looking to do custom fab or just doing unique things, that's the car that I think you could have the most potential with. So Yeah, and, and as far as like a sport, slash utility vehicle goes if you're going to put somebody that doesn't have a lot of experience into a side-by-side in my case that would be like maybe my wife or something i, I was have, just going to say my have, wife would love that car would have no reservations whatsoever Absolutely. about putting her behind the wheel of that yep yep so and, um yeah great car again shout out to west side motorsports just outside of spokane washington uh, the west side of spokane washington on the west plains um check them out for all your deals they can order your cars and accessories and all that stuff they have a big stock of selection of parts and and things that you can do um, they also are a full service dirt bike and motorbike shop so if you have the need for tires they have a dedicated tire shop now they can get you in and out the same day um and uh yeah big shout out to those guys and uh, look forward to doing more work with them and uh yeah been a great time having you back in the studio uh ian and uh we got a lot more things to talk about so uh until next time guys stay tuned peace (laughs) 